Hello and welcome to the Thread to Men podcast. My name is Taylor and I'm coming to you from Baltimore, Maryland. And this is a podcast about all things fiber related. Mostly knitting and spinning, but sometimes fiber prep um, from a fleece and other crafts. This is the first episode post Maryland Sheep and Wool Festival. One, I didn't take any footage. I was just in the moment and I think I don't even have a single photograph from my time spent there. Um, and two, I had a lot of fun. It's been quite a bit of time since Maryland. That was the first weekend of May. And next weekend, I think, is Memorial Day weekend. So I've been really busy. I've tried to record a couple times, and life is just kind of getting in the way of it. Um, not just that I'm busy at work, but sometimes I just don't feel like in the mood um and you might you might record a podcast um or try to record a podcast and know that the camera shows you a very objective version of yourself and sometimes when I watch myself back one I ramble a lot and two I feel like I just don't enjoy my mood (laughs) So, um, I've just been kind of physically tired, um, and yeah, it's kind of wiping me out. I'm a little wiped out right now. So, I'm kind of like amping up my attitude (laughs) to record this. This is the second or third time I'm like recording this morning because I just rambled a lot. So let's get into it. I bought some stuff at Maryland, not a lot, but I reached my top of my budget. And I brought home a fleece. Uh, let me see, where did I put that? I bought um, a merino fleece. Oh Got a little cat hairs from the table. Anyway, this fleece. Um, is most of it is a four inch staple some of it's a three inch staple where there were some second cuts and I processed this fleece more meticulously than I ever have I started by laying the whole fleece out on my dining room table on top of a a piece of fabric and I picked out hunks about this size from the best parts first. And I laid them out row after row after row after row. And then I flicked open the ends with my hand combs. I pretty much held it in a grip like this. And then I took my hand combs, or if you had a flicker, you could use a flicker, and I flicked out the ends. Um, Because this was a this was a coated fleece, um, some of the ends were a little bit felted, and just a little bit dirty. The the tips were a little dirtier than the coat of the, or than the rest of the fiber. So um, I flicked at the ends before washing, and what that did was it removed any of the areas that would have broken off in the combing process later, and it opened up the ends so that all of the oil and the dirt would fall out rather than get stuck at the ends. And so it was a lot of work to comb the to comb out the tips of every part of this fleece. And so it took much longer than any other fleece washing I've ever ever done. So um, I would first start with laying out the hunks of yarn in rows and then row after row, hunk after hunk, combing them out and then having combed out rows. And then I would wash in my Uh, I don't have it up here, but from the thrift store I got this large um, pot. It's not the biggest pot you could use, um, but it has, um, I'm guessing it's for like, it's like a lobster pot. It has um, a holy thing that pairs with it that you pull out and you can drain it out. So my method of of washing um, was I would take that, I'll just call it a strainer. I would take out the strainer and I would grab um, a handful of fiber and I would place two rows in the strainer and I would I would layer one, two, and then layer, layer, layer till it's full. So I'd fill up the strainer and I'd take it to the stove. I fill my 
pot with water and bring it up. Um, I, I fill my pot with water, I put it on the stove. I add about um, a couple tablespoons of my shampoo. I used my own shampoo to wash this fleece rather than a scouring solution and boy am I so happy I did. It was the best advice I had ever gotten and I would recommend anybody wash their fleece with a really good quality shampoo versus some product that smells funny and I don't know what's in it. Um, and so I would add the soap. I used a different strainer I had to kind of just mix the soap in with the water. Um, so that is like a food strainer that literally, I mean, other than it being in the pot I use to wash fleece at like high temperatures, it never came in contact with the wool because it was always added to the clean water with soap. So I feel okay about that. And I would take the fiber out handfuls at a time and in the same, still facing the same direction, two rows, I put that in the pot and then I put the strainer on top and I smooshed it down and immediately you see the the dirt and the you know oil or whatever like come up through the water almost in like where you could see it was concentrated at the ends and so you're pushing the fiber through the water so it gets it clean really well and then I remove it and then the water kind of swells back into the fiber and then I'll do that like two or three times and because it's a very even surface pressing down it's not agit agitating the fiber to move it out of kind of its organization um, and I never had an issue with felting so I would uh, get the I would keep the stove on and I used my compost thermometer because that's the only thermometer I have um, to to stay on track of the temperature of the water so I made sure that the water got up to 140 you want your water washing fleece your fleece washing water to be at 140 degrees to get the lanolin to liquefy and off the fiber so I'd get it up to 140 and I'd set my timer for 15 minutes I would move the strainer back into the pot to push the fleece down to the bottom and then I would go outside and dump that shampoo again my shampoo I could totally use in it would be safe to use um, you know near ponds or whatever like it's supernatural it's actually Karina organics if you're interested c-a-r-i-n-a -A, organics so I would dump that out into the alley and then I would turn my tap on as hot as it gets and I would put it on the sprayer and I would kind of spray over the fiber really well, in, always in the same kind of direction. And then I would bring it back onto the stove and turn the gas on till it was up to 140 and then I would let that sit for 15 minutes. And then I would uh, push the strainer down, strain that out into the sink because most of the lanolin and the dirt was like removed out back. Um, it was really raining that day so I kind of cut corners and just used the pipes or whatever. Um, generally you don't want to put lanolin heavy water down your own pipes if you're processing a lot of wool because it can kind of gunk up your your pipes and we have pipes that are almost a hundred years old so anyway um, not all of them but probably the waste lines for sure and then I would maybe do one more little bit of a rinse especially at the bottom but this fleece was so clean I, I literally did one wash and one rinse and that was it um, there so then I would take my put my like heavy duty rubber gloves on pick it up squish it out put it on a towel in rows again organizing it kind of nicely roll up the towel step on the towel and then transfer that wool onto another towel with a fan set up to blow on it overnight. And by the next day it's mostly dry, but by the day after it's completely dry, and then that's when I store it in pillowcases. So I finally did that with all my fleece. Actually, I still have the last 
day of work still on my floor waiting to be put into a pillowcase but I realized I don't have enough pillowcases so I need to go to the thrift store and get a couple more um, when I was sorting my fleece I sorted it into three areas I started with the very best and I processed most of that on the first day of washing on Sunday um, Two weeks later, I got around to everything that I had prepped, and there was kind of, so I finished the first quality, and then I washed the second quality. And the only difference is that the staple length was quite a little bit different. The, the, the best quality was four inch staple length, and then the second quality was like a three inch staple length. But all of it was very clean, and not highly concentrated with like urine or anything like that. Um, but in the second quality, it didn't get quite as clean as like the first quality because it had a little bit more concentration at the tips. And I just continued with the single bath and single rinse. Um, again, always at 140. So both the bath and the rinse were at 140 both times. So I kind of stripped the lanolin well. Um, and then I had this like third quality batch, which I like concentrated into like only two wash, two like containers of washing, which really should have been like three or four, but I was done. I was so over washing fleece and it was like the end of my day. I just like needed to finish it sooner than later. And so I just did. And I only kept that and washed that for stuffing so this is a really um it's a really nice fleece and it's totally worth using everything i can of it so i i salvaged all the remaining bits that weren't like i only had one bit of like poo in the whole bag which is thank god um but there was um you know the areas around not there was not a lot of leggy parts in the fleece but the areas like closer towards the belly or closer towards the legs or even some parts like around the neck which can be a little bit more felted because there's more like movement of the coat and stuff like that um, I salvaged those and I washed those and I plan to just flick them open and use them to stuff things like pillows and whatnot um, and those got mostly clean I feel like I kind of really cut corners on at least one of those baths and I could have done it a better job. Um, I did kind of hand prep a little sample to see how it w did and holy smokes like not only was this fleece super duper clean I think I did a really thorough job in washing it I think that I processed it in such a way where I made the process of washing it as important as the after wash processing where you really like comb it out and I did so much work flicking the ends open before washing that when I got to combing this sample it was just a breeze um, this entire fleece processing has felt like a lot of work but other than the combing of the tips it was an absolute breeze to wash because of that combing out and it was an absolute breeze to comb because of that car carding out um, so just like how I used, I, because of the flicking of the ends, I was able to do, I was able to process it in one wash and one rinse. I'm able to comb it out on my combs with just one pass over and then taking it off. So I'm really happy um, with this fleece. I don't know if I'm going to dye any of it and then comb it out and then spin it. I might experiment with like really small batches of bright colors from my jacquard acid dyes because I already own those and I have them and I would love to like spit hand spin some yarn that's funky and fun and I, I know that you know with like four or five pounds of fiber I have more than enough to experiment with in dyeing. Um, I don't wear a lot of white so I'm not sure if I'm going to knit I'm, if I'm going to spin it natural, I'm sure I'll spin some natural and, and use that white for color work or something. Um, but we'll see. 
I've also been spinning a little bit. I started spinning the Jacob fleece that I had in storage in the basement. This fleece was given to me by a very lovely person I met on Ravelry. Um, and she bought this fleece and had it machine carded and wasn't thrilled with the result that she got and it has just been sitting in her home and she wanted to make space for new things in her life and just knew she was never going to get around to it and she graciously offered it to me for free and I started spinning it because it was weighing on me too. I was like, oh, I have all this fiber. When am I going to start it? And I just, it's been, I feel like late winter, early spring, I just blew up with projects. I started this, this, and that, and this was one of those things. So I spun two full bobbins of singles, and then I spun those singles two ply into two separate skeins. Um, one of them is about 102 grams, and one is about 112. They're both eight wraps, eight or nine wraps per inch, and I forget the exact yardage. Um, I think they came out close to 200 yards each. I do plan to knit, I do plan to spin a sweater quantity and knit a sweater with these, um, a nice outerwear sweater, maybe even a cardigan. I'm not sure of the pattern yet, so we'll see. And I finished my dandelion field shawl, which um, I absolutely adored in the making of this project. I loved the yarn, and I thought I was obsessed with Stellina Sparkle two ply fingering weight yarn. Um, but I have qualms about, <laughs> I've never knit, I've never uh, sewn in the ends to a superwash and not had these little ponytails pop out. So that's kind of annoying to me. Um, but I think that the sparkle, although it's like really, really fun to knit with, I think personally wearing sparkled garments is... Um, I don't know, it's just, it feels kind of like, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how I feel about it. I mean, I'm, I'm really glad that I have one sparkle object, but I don't think I'm going to become obsessed with it the way I thought I would, was going to while I was knitting it. Um, my first impression of wearing sparkle yarn before wearing sparkle yarn was that it was gonna be great and now I'm like mm, I don't know the sparkles are kind of like a little cheesy no offense to anybody that loves to wear sparkles because I am happy to wear sparkles I just don't know if I want sparkles in everything now so this is finished I'm really glad to have finished something because I feel like I started a bunch and I have a lot of projects up in the air and I can't work on all of them at the same time and it's stressing me out a little bit um, having so much to do so I'm making it a point of focus to just work on what I've started and get things finished and perhaps not start new things before finishing old things in the future like I thought would be a great idea um, but I have a, a lot, because what happens is that I have, I kind of like bit off a little more than I could chew. And then I'm like looking at all the things I have and I'm like, I still want to make stuff with you all. Um, but I, yeah, anyway, rambling. At Maryland Sheep and Wool, I did buy some other things other than this single fleece. I bought a really cool handcrafted broom for um, our home and then uh, we bought one for my mother-in-law um, for Mother's Day and they're both really great. I, I really enjoy that. I didn't buy any soaps this year. I skipped the soaps. I had recently bought a few bars of soap at the store on sale and I was like, you know what, this is nice and affordable. I'm just gonna stick with this and not stock up on soap. I bought a couple shawl pins. Um, one of them is handcrafted. Oh, they were both probably handcrafted, but this one was handcrafted by a local woman. Um, her name's Danielle Craven Slasky. She was so sweet, and I actually lost this somewhere in my house. I know it's in my house, but I have a cat that finds novel things and thinks they're toys, and then I lose them. <laughs> So it's somewhere, and I wish I could show it to you, and as soon as I find it, I will. Um, it's made from a honey locust branch, 
and I just love this little card that it came with and I have been holding on to this to show you um, and I love that it shares little facts about the honey locust tree like at the end it says extracts from this tree have been used to treat rheumatoid arthritis and that just really touched my heart because um, when I was a kid I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis I never actually saw a rheumatologist as a kid I was like 10 years old we had to drive like 45 minutes to the children's hospital to like see anybody and they ran they pulled all this blood which at the, when I was that that age it seemed like a way lot of blood <laughs> it's probably like four four or five vials anyway that's what they said was the cause of all my hand and, and foot pain and I'm just like experiencing a lot of pain in my joints right now sometimes it's in my hands but not like it when I was a kid it's just general like inflammation because I've been working like really hard on prepping that fleece I mean my hands were tired my shoulder was tired um, but I'm experiencing a lot of low back pain and, and hip pain and I'm just exploring that it's been at least six or seven weeks now that I've been dealing with that and I have a rheumatologist appointment so I'm excited to see a professional to tell me where this pain is originating and maybe why I mean I think I know why but we'll see and that's just been physically exhausting so I'm a little overwhelmed with like the sensations of daily living and then all of the tasks that I've began and then work has kind of really picked up um, a lot and I've had to be there a little more than I wanted to and so I'm just feeling like really tired and that's why it really why I haven't recorded because I've been like just disintegrating into a pile of complaints <laughs> and ain't nobody got time for that so uh, on the day of Maryland Sheep and Wool, we got there at like 8 a.m. and got in the doors at 8.30. I spent probably an hour in the fleece barn, and then I bought the brooms. I bought a pound of local beeswax that smells absolutely divine. Um, I used my kitchen... It's not a shredder. a food processor to shred the hunk. I mean, it came in a big block of beeswax. My sister-in-law helps me, like, cut it up into chunks because she's, like, crazy strong. And um, I just shredded it all, and I cleaned. I mean, I wanted to put it off, but I knew better than to shred most of it but not all of it because I don't want to clean that thing more than once because it's a mess to get out. Um, and I made some hand salve. So... I saved these little sample containers from all the like lush face masks and things like that. I pretty much save any container I think I can reuse. And I poured a bunch of these and it's um, it's a little heavy on the beeswax. I think I should have added more oil. It makes a super great um, cuticle cream. So it's like that kind of consistency. Um, and it makes a great lip balm, although it's kind of tough to put a bunch on. But I love lip balm with beeswax in it because it holds and it lasts. So I poured, I, I poured a bunch of these and I really like it. Um, I added about 50 grams of beeswax and about 75 grams of a combination of vitamin E oil mostly vitamin E oil and argan oil and then about 10 drops of lavender essential oil so it has a nice fragrance to it but honestly I can still smell that luscious local beeswax fragrance I I mean I think most of our most of us have an impulse to buy something that we can't find locally on Amazon um, and I've just had a lot of bad experiences buying things on Amazon that I receive and they're like of a lesser quality than I had hoped. And I knew I didn't want to buy a beeswax that would kind of stink like weird. I really wanted beeswax that smelled yummy and delicious and I got that. So I'm super pumped on it. Um, 
and I got honey and then I bought a sweaters quantity of yarn from Green Mountain Spinnery and I'm not even lying when I tell you that I spent like all the money I allotted for this day like in booth after booth after booth like next to one another like the broom guy was right by the honey guys and the honey guys were right by the brooch people oh I also bought like a little mushroom darning egg which is really cute um, which I, I don't know when I'll need that again but um, you know you never know and then Green Aunt Spinnery was like right next door to those people and Brian my husband spelled with a Y by the way um, I wanted to knit a sweater for him or should I say the next sweater quantity of yarn I was going to choose to buy I wanted to be for him because eventually I want to knit him a sweater and um, I have a couple quantities sweater quantities of yarn already so I knew that I wanted to buy a sweater quantity for Brian at Maryland and I just saw this yarn and I knew it was would be great he was with me so I was able to you know check in with him and see if he really liked it if you can't tell um, this is a kind of a blend of dyed wools. It's, it looks black and it is mostly black, but it has within it olive green and like dark navy blue. And it is from a mill that is a cooperative. So it's, it's owner operated um, and, and the workers own the mill. And it's a sock weight yarn. 400 yards. I don't know if this is 100 grams or 115 grams because it's nice and, you know, bulky. And I'm not sure. But I bought about five skeins of this. She assured me that five skeins would be enough. Um, I'm going to start talking loud. It's raining pretty hard now. I have the window open because I was wearing this shawl. It was getting kind of warm. So I bought that and I'm really excited to have it. I'm not planning to cast on a sweater for some time until I finish the two sweaters I've started, which will get done eventually. And then after we felt like our trip to Maryland was complete, I we went to Frederick for lunch and I stopped into the knot, knot house again and I bought myself a skein of Olan and Olan is a dyer based out of Ireland and this is a two-ply superwash merino nylon blend in 80-20 and I just really like these speckles. Again, it's another yellow skein. Last episode I showed you a yellow skein. And I don't know what I'm going to make with it, but I think I might make this the yoke of the new Caitlin Hunter Colorwork sweater. Um, this isn't the skein because I didn't think to grab it for some reason, but I have upstairs some O wool fingering weight two ply yarn that is like identical to this yarn, but solid and in this color. And I think that that might be a really cool sweater project. Um, last episode I showed you two skeins that I was planning to over dye and I did that. I put together a batch of my ochre jacquard dye and I over dyed the skein, the full skein with that to make it a little more rich and to cover any areas that seemed a little less saturated than others um, because there was just a couple spots, just a few spots where it was white and so I covered that up and so the skein looks so much like it originally did, which I'm so happy with because that dyer um, does great, great work. And then I over dyed this skein of Magpie. And I obviously don't put a lot of effort into reskeining my stuff because it looks kind of, of a mess. But um, I over dyed this and it is less of a blue gray color and more of a straw yellow color. Um, I don't know if I like it more than I did before. Um, I don't regret it. I think it was a nice experiment, but 
I have these skeins and I still don't know what I'm going to knit with them. Um, and I'm going to put myself on hold with buying yarn, like I've said in the past, I'm sure. Um, but I have so many things that I c could be making that I, I just have to get to. And so I'm going to close the doors and not let any more yarn in. <laughs> Especially while I'm like spinning yarn. So I have a bunch of fiber that needs to make be made into yarn. There's no reason I should keep buying more. So I'm on a yarn diet and I'm really okay with that. Um, I don't know if there's anything else I haven't shown you. I, I was knitting on my way to Maryland Sheep and Wool. I was knitting the Colorwork Yoke design to my Ola sweater, which is so close to being done it's embarrassing that I haven't finished it yet um, and I knit more than halfway through the pattern and realized I just did not like the transition of the white and the pink and I don't have the yarn down here oops it looks like I do let me grab it so originally um, I was going to transition the gray into the white and the white into the pink and then continue with these other mauvey colors and I found ship, ship. I found that the white and the pink had a very stark contrast and so I decided that what I would rather do is do white to gray to pink to mauve and I think that that contrast will be a little more subtle. And I don't know, we'll see. I hope I don't regret it because I did rip out like a couple inches of color work to apply fingering weight. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I do feel like it's a little more cohesive of a blend. This is the original. And this is the, so I think like, you know, in the, in the Ola yoke sweater, it goes blue, white, yellow, dark yellow, orange. And so I kind of looked at it as if this is a spectrum and then this is, um, like this is a warm spectrum and then this is a cool color on the other side of a natural white. And I thought I would maintain that, but I realized without a stark or without like a, a real color, like real color, <laughs> I mean to say, it, these aren't fake colors, but I mean, this is an, a neutral on top of a neutral, and not a cool on top of a neutral. I feel like it just didn't translate the same. And so I feel like this might be more of a nice gradient that kind of transitions well. Um, and I think that the reason I'm having this issue is that these two colors and these two colors really blend together so well that the subtlety of these being very different from one another was more stark than in the original design where I think every color had a slightly less blended transition. Like you could differentiate the yellow and the dark yellow better then you can differentiate the two mauves together. So that's sort of why I'm still on this project because I started and restarted and that'll get done eventually. And I have another sweater project I'm still working on that's had no progress since I last showed you. Um, and another sock, a couple socks. I have like three socks on the needles right now and I know that once I cast these off, I will feel much better about the number of projects I have going. Um, but this is my first Eye of Partridge heel. And this is the first time I've ever done a heel flap and gusset. And I didn't use a row counter to count my rows. And I'm having a really hard time manually counting my rows because every other stitch is slipped. So I'm just not sure how many rows I've knit and whether it's time to do that little short row thing that you do that I've never done before, or if I need to like rip back a row or two. And like, how much does it matter 
being on point with the total number. I mean, one thing I didn't do also was I didn't slip the first stitch. So that's not easy to count because it's very like a little rough. Anyway, I have the legs done and I just have to turn the heels, knit the foot, and then decrease the toes. And these um, socks are knit with such a thick weight yarn that it's, I don't know, maybe like 40 something stitches in the round. So these are nearly done and yet I haven't really worked on them in the last couple weeks. Um, if you haven't already watched it, the Dunkel Grun podcast has a really great episode that just went up not long ago about wool wash. And she is like a chemist, and so she understands chemical processes in a way that I don't. And what she had to say on that podcast reaffirmed my experience with a wool wash I showed you on this podcast. I previously showed you a like little haul video of products I bought from Woolen and & Company. And I said I wasn't in love with the salve, but I'm really excited for this wool wash bar. And it turns out that my first impressions are completely swapped. I absolutely love the salve and I would highly recommend it. And the wool wash is not something I would buy again. Um, if you watch the Dunkel Groom podcast, you'll see why one ought not to use bar soap for washing wool. And essentially it has to do with the chemical process of that soap meeting the calcium in our water, which is in all water unless it's boiled water and it would um, create like a soap scum sort of thing. So I, I felt that in the end product of a brand new sweater that I had finished knitting and blocked and it just wasn't as lustrous and it wasn't as drapey as it felt when I was knitting it. So I feel that I'll have to rewash that garment one or two times to kind of get it back into a, a more relaxed state, but it just feels a little bit crunchy and a little bit duller than I remember the yarn feeling while I knit with it. Um, so I think that's all I have to show you. I'm sorry I didn't take any footage of Marilyn Sheep and Wool. Um, I know a lot of podcasters will show you like bits and pieces of their lives and these fiber events, but I would just so much rather be in the moment and experiencing things uh, through the lens of my eyeballs and my mouth with my husband than recording it and documenting it and um, I don't know, it's just a different experience um, and it's one I didn't choose so. I don't have that to show you, but you know, it's like any other fiber festival. You, you know, you go and you enjoy it and then you go home. <laughs> um, I've recorded this podcast a couple times today. So I hope I reviewed everything I planned to. Um, I really enjoy recording and yet I don't, I don't know, I don't know, I'm just, <sighs> anyway, <laughs> so I hope that I showed you the dandelion field shawl as much as you wanted to see it. Uh, I did get some great feedback about giving more time close up on objects to give you all a better viewing of them. And I would recommend this shawl pattern to anybody. It is really clear. Um, I really felt like the instructions were easy to understand. Um, and I'm really happy with the end result. I might block this again. Uh, for two reasons. One, um, it really smells funny, like vinegar. It smells like the dye bath. Even though I blocked it with a little bit of soap, I feel like I need a, a stronger scented soap. 
to reblock this and it kind of after wearing it it did sort of like curl up again at the ends and kind of shrink back so I might do a more aggressive blocking to show off the lace so there's that and I just can't wait to keep making things so that I have something to show you all um, Again, I have so many projects started, I just don't know really where to start. And I think I'm avoiding it right now by recording and re-recording and then re-recording and doubting whether what I have to record is worthy of your eyes and ears. So I'm just going to dip on out of that pool of doubt and just keep on going. So um, I want to thank you for watching the episode today and if you are a subscriber thanks for subscribing if you're not yet a subscriber please feel free to subscribe and stay up to date on future podcast episodes I also record little short videos of my garden um, I've done two already uh, over the last couple months and I don't tack on the thread to men podcast like keyword search thing because it's not about fiber but if you're interested in seeing what I'm growing you can go to my YouTube channel and find those episodes they get like way fewer views than my podcast so um, I realize you probably don't know they exist uh, so if you're interested in gardening or what I'm growing in my garden you can check out those videos on my channel and if you enjoyed this podcast episode, please give me a thumbs up and subscribe so that um, other people see that this podcast is available to watch. I hope you have a great day, and I want to thank you so much for being here, and please take care. Bye.